And a very good evening. It is Sunday the 1st of November. Where did October go? <laughs> Where did 2020 go? Um, it's just gone 8pm here in the UK, 3pm on the East Coast, midday on the West Coast. And I can't do any more time zone at this time of night uh, uh, on a Sunday when I've got to go back to work. I've had all week off this week, so I've got to go back to work tomorrow. I'm really not looking forward to it, but hey, there you go. Um, we're here with the ProSynth Network show live uh, coming from the UK and uh, from America as well. And we are joined by a very special guest this week. And of course, our resident um, ProSynth Network founder, as well uh ben simpson and today michael whalen good afternoon good evening to you both hello great to see you guys um michael we'll come to you in just a minute ben um how are you been up to much sir I, i'm good yeah i've had a like yourself i've had a week off work and i've been working on some uh, new tracks in the studio here I had a great time it's the first time that i've put uh, everything through its paces since I, I moved yeah. and I've had a couple of teething problems but really enjoyed it it's great to be back doing something again excellent after after quite a long break <laughs> <laughs> yeah good stuff and uh, Michael welcome to the show sir it's uh, it's an honor to have you here thank you very much it's uh it's great to be here here we are Sunday afternoon here in New York City so excellent I was, I was just gonna say whereabouts are you you're in the Bronx aren't you I'm in the Bronx. I'm as far south in the Bronx and still in the Bronx. So I'm about 100 yards away from Manhattan across the river. So right. cool. very, very close to the city. Excellent. And this is your is this your main kind of working environment that we find you in today? Yes, I am trapped here in the mothership. <laughs> and uh, this is my, my 10 by 12 bedroom. And uh, my wife was very nice because she gave me the, the bedroom for my studio here in our apartment. And... Uh, yeah, this is where it all happens. Excellent stuff. So you, you guys have got very considerate other halves. Actually, we all have, to be honest. I mean, Ben's sitting in the, his his studio at home, which is this very large room downstairs in his house that was it was like some kind of reception room, wasn't it? And then, yeah, um, yeah. And, and then Vicky just turns around and says, "You might as well have that for your studio." And I couldn't believe it. It was like yeah. a lottery win. It really was. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah I'm quite happy. I I get I get moaned at because I have this room which is like a is one of the bedrooms. It's, we have a four bedroom house and I have two kids, so they have their own bedrooms. Me and the wife have ours, and then this is like the the second biggest bedroom in in the house. Even has an ensuite toilet and and shower next wow. door. So I just never have to come out. You know, I can come in yeah. here, spend days, and come out smelling fresh. Um, That's no, brilliant. And I'm, and I'm very glad you're cleaning yourself. So indeed, that's... yes, <laughs> indeed. The only problem is, is that it's it's not noise proof. So you know, after I've been, I have to kind of wait for the system to fill up before I can start doing stuff again. But hey, there you go. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so uh, we've got a, a, a whole list of things to talk about because uh, it has been a very interesting week uh, this week in Synth World. And we'll go through a whole bunch of topics. Of course, we will talk to uh, Michael a little bit later on in a bit more detail uh, about his career, what he does and, and how he does it. And uh, I, I just need to mention that I'm not seeing anything in the live chat at the moment. I don't know if you uh, ben can see anything there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. So, it. yeah. <laughs> so it's just me. And what I'm what I'm wary of is that if I refresh my uh, page here, that it might yeah. disturb the force. Um, and so I, I'm not entirely <coughs> sure. Let me see if if I pop out the chat. Maybe that'll just refresh the chat. And because I, I want to see what people are saying, you know, I'm 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 very uh, self conscious. I want to know if people are having a. Oh, there you go. So they're all there. Let me see if I, if I do that and restore it back in. Uh, it doesn't work. No. Okay. Well, that's okay. Uh, I can keep an eye on the chat if you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I've I've I figured it out. It's for some reason it's not working in situ. Um. So right. I have to pop it out. But that's good because. Um, I can now see everyone. So let's say hi to uh, everyone in the chat room, um, because uh, you know these these are the guys we do it for, and the girls. Of course, we do it for the guys and the girls, and uh, anything else in between. Of course, we are completely non-discriminatory here. Uh, so hello to Wagyu, uh, to Ben Divkid Video, uh, Asio Head Native VS. Uh, who else have we got in here? Marshall Arnold. He's just come over from Jamie's show, which was running until about half an hour ago. Uh, Blade Runner, uh, Imperfect Aaron. Not imperfect Aaron. He's not imperfect at all, but that's his name, Aaron. 
Uh, <laughs> his pseudonym is imperfect. Uh, Sasquatch, Inky, and Atto Z. Uh, who else have I missed? Uh, have I missed anyone? Sasquatch, Synth Addict, Yana Seta. Um, you have to tell me, Yana, are, are you from. You must be from the Nordics with a name like that. I'm guessing Finland, but tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, and I hope I haven't insulted you. Uh, uh, the Because I know that I pronounce your name. Apparently, I, I pronounce your name correctly, which is, <laughs> you know, great. Uh, but that's because we have quite a, a strong Nordic connection in this region. So I, I guess maybe that's what it is. Um, and I think, Inky as well. Yeah, I, yeah I, think, I think I mentioned Inky, which is always so, great to see. Um, Simon. Oh, and Simon's in the room. Uh, Simon, yeah. and I've got to do it. Simon we, in his infinite synth cave. <laughs> <laughs> got to be done at least once a week. Uh, of oh. course, if you are, <laughs> if you're not particularly worried uh, about, I was right, Finland. Yes, get in. Um, yes. Timu Puki, and he'll know what that means. Um, let me think. Uh, yes, if you want to play along, we have a little fun game that uh, Native VS um, has started a few weeks ago, which is uh, ProSynth Network Bingo. So if you go to the YouTube page, which I'm, I'm guess you, guessing you're all on, if you look in the description, uh, there's a link to a bingo card, and you can uh, have that on a second screen or in a second window, or you can print it off, and uh, it <laughs> contains a list of commonly uttered phrases that we have on the show. I'm not going to say what some of them are because then it will give you all a head start. But uh, we, we like to have a little kind of uh, bingo game in the background. So go, go at it and let us know if, you've, if, we, if we get a bingo. Um, so shall we, <laughs> after, after all of that, let's go on and uh, go to our first news topic of the week, which I think, you know, if you're, if you're watching many of these shows uh, online <clears throat> this, this week, I guess this is the top story. Uh, the wonderful guys at Modal uh, down in Bristol who have come up with uh, the next uh, in line of their uh, their synthesizers that are working off this common platform I did somebody did tell me what the common platform name is but this new synth is called uh, Cobalt 8 it was teased uh, a few weeks ago at uh, Synthfest UK the virtual version and it was announced uh, midweek this week it is an eight voice virtual analog extended virtual analog that's their uh, their words not mine um and it uses this very unique feature of having these algorithms which of course gives you know hints of uh, you know the type of synthesis that i'm into uh, currently um you notice i didn't say the word because again i don't want these bingo people getting too too ahead too soon um so this is extended virtual analog but it has these um very powerful oscillator algorithms that can be you know there's something like 30 odd of them and they can be blended and mixed together um we can have one or the other or a combination of the two lots of modulation uh in their lfos uh i think there's three lfos in total there's obviously a stack of effects um and a nice four pole um ladder filter in there as well 34 complex sophisticated algorithms and this morphable four pole ladder filter um, 512 note real time step sequencer, 32 step programmable arpeggiator, which of course has also got animation lanes, so you can record, you know, your your, your knob twiddling, um, lots of connectivity at the back, so you've got MIDI and uh, USB. Let me just get the picture up here on the screen. Uh, yeah, MIDI, USB MIDI, uh, sync in, sync out. You've got an audio input as well. I'm not entirely sure where that's rooted, uh, whether that goes through uh, like the filter or anything. And of course, all your audio and pedal connections at the back. It features the Fatar keybed, which is a very, very nice keybed with aftertouch and velocity. And it retails for a round 579 of your British pounds, which whatever that equates to, uh, in the US, I think it's probably just a little over 600 in the US and probably about the same uh, in euros. Uh, compatible, fully compatible with the modal app, which is available on Mac, PC, and iOS, which gives you a huge amount of right up front kind of editing uh, and library capabilities. And it's just a stunning little piece of equipment. Um, I'm going to go to our guest first, going to put him on the spot and ask Michael um, if you have any thoughts or opinions on, on this. Is this something that you might see um, adorning some space that you can possibly find in your room there? 
De definitely. I, uh, uh, modal stuff is beautiful. Mm. And uh, mm. if, you've, uh, if you guys have never used it, uh, it has a very, very interesting quality of sound. The little mm. ones, the big ones. I've been on the hunt for a 002 for a while, mm. trying to find one in decent shape. Uh, but over the last few years, uh, and you know, maybe you and Ben will probably know more about this than I have, it seems like the direction of the company has gone from making expensive synthesizers that were two, three, four thousand dollars to making synthesizers that were much more affordable. Yeah. And like, they're like jammed with features and uh, you know, and you know, under that a thousand dollar, you know, price point. And uh, I think it's great, you know, because I, I think they make great stuff and uh, uh, it, it yeah, I, I, you know, let me dive on it quick. Yeah, <laughs> quick. Um, yeah, I th you're absolutely right. What you say about uh, modal having a sound—they they definitely do have a sound, and I guess it's something that they've they've really kind of worked on. And I remember playing with the 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 two and the eight at uh, Synthfest a few years ago, and was just like, wow, this is immense. And then I saw the price tag; it too was immense. And yeah. uh, I just thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to afford something like this. And then you see this stuff, and of course you've got the Craft Synth and the Sculpt, which apparently are built on the same platform, uh, development platform, as these. So all of these things kind of have a, a lineage. And I know there was a lot of um, stuff online the last couple of days, people saying, oh, it's just a rebadged Argon 8, and it really isn't. And when I was speaking to their VP of Sales, um, who I'm you know, trying to, you know, do everything to get one of these here for you know just to try out um he said look you know if you talk about this to anyone really you know push home this fact that this is it's a it's a development platform that's shared and that's it there's no cross pollination of firmware or anything they're different things that they're, they're not compatible with each other you know one's a wavetable one's virtual analog um, but it, it really is um it's a lovely i mean it's a lovely thing to look at as well i know these things are designed to to, to make music but it's if it looks good that's that's always nice and I, I like that blue that's a very nice blue Ben what do you think sir yeah well you, you've answered all my questions oh, good. right we'll move really, on. Because, uh, <laughs> I, I, was, <laughs> I was interested uh, to to find out exactly what uh, the the similarities are between this and the argon is it literally a different bunch of electronics inside the same case or is it a platform that can run different software I, I... so it yeah i mean I've, I've asked that question and not had a, a a super specific answer what i know without opening these up is that the obviously obviously this is all dsp based so you know whether it's a yeah. at the argon 8 or the 8 they're dsp based and so it's essentially a computer program running on a whole bunch of dedicated uh, chips and, and software and circuitry whether they're absolutely identical internally and it's just everything's in software I mean this has got this four pole fill, uh, ladder fill to which of course the Argon 8 doesn't have so maybe it's you know maybe mm. internally there are some chips that are different but the, yeah. the core platform and this was something that Philip Taysom was telling me a few weeks back is that you know they've really thought about um, this this creating a platform on which they can build a whole range of things so it's a very flexible um kind of platform so i, I guess that there's there's going to be it, everything's going that way nowadays you know whether you yeah, buy yeah. you know if you buy a vw then you, under the, you take away the, the shell there's it's the same as an audi uh yeah. you know because it's all one company fiat chrysler um, you know, they're all one company. Lancer, you know, I remember in the days in the 90s when you could buy a Fiat, an Alpha, a Lancia, and there was another Auto Bianchi. Um, and underneath the metalwork, they were all they were all sharing common platforms. So it yeah. makes sense for this to, to go that way as well, I guess. So, yeah, it does. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, like, there will be some, if it is possible, there will be somebody who hacks it and tries to get the Oh, yeah. Earth. That you, you'll have a cobalt inside an argon and vice versa uh, if it is if it is possible yeah uh, it's quite interesting about the other formats as well because the cases already exist for them so there's the the big argon a thing what what is it the the atex or whatever ATX, yes. uh, uh, and the rack mounted one as well mm -hmm. that uh, uh, 
that'd look great in a rack mount there. Yeah, well, the, I'm a big rack mount fan. The the desktop <laughs> modules of these aren't actually rack mounted. They they don't come with ears uh, as such. Right. Although, if you look at the Cobalt Eight video that Phil did, and it, I, I, can I just say it is wonderful to see Philip Taysom on screen because this guy goes way way back. I mean, he had a studio. If you took everything that's in these three studios here, mixed it up with Simon's Infinite Synth Cave, we would still not have the amount of synthesizers wow. that Philip had in his. He's such a gear nerd. Um, but he, he's been unwell. And so it's right. absolutely wonderful to see him. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. Yeah, um, yeah. And I've completely lost the the, the the track that I was going down. Um, the rat mounted version. The rat mounted, yeah. Sorry, if you watch yeah. the video with Phil, he's got an Argon 8M in the, the rack on the desk. So it's doable, but I don't think it like out of the box i'm not sure if it comes with the years yeah 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 um i can't say uh whether it, this will come in an x and an m module that is i'm not allowed to say okay ah. so uh, oh okay. top secret yeah. okay yeah cool. ndos and all that um <laughs> so right. take from that what you will uh but yeah this this looks and sounds and it does sound really really nice it has as Michael said, it's got this modal quality that is not just like every other analog synth because it's not. Well, you know. well, one, of the, one of the things that drives me crazy and maybe it does, you know, all of a sudden you're going to say it's an analog, you know, modeling hybrid synth and all of the analog purists are all going to get huffy and puffy yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's just wait, see what it sounds like first, see what it sounds like. People just like dive on this stuff and it's just like, yeah. Guys, like, don't have a purist conversation when it's really, like, at least to me, I think mobile has done a, a really excellent job at creating, like, a little oasis for itself of things that sound like them. And if you want that, that's what you get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And whether whether it's real analog or hybrid or whatever, I you know, because um, I like instruments that have a personality. Yeah. I don't want something that's going to try to, like, be all things to all people because very often they're kind of crappy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 couldn't agree more. And it was funny because um, there's a, there's a group on Facebook called Synth Memes, which I think most people you know in this community subscribe just for the giggles. Um, and some of them are, you know, are hilarious, and some of them eh, not so much. And within like 24 hours of uh, Cobalt Eight coming out, um, somebody had done this uh, this synth meme where they got a picture of the uh, the Argon Eight, uh, and it says new wavetable synth, and then a picture of the Cobalt Eight Eight, and then next to it, it said firmware upgrade and it's <laughs> yeah it's just like come on guys this it, a it isn't Hi. and and b you know like like michael's just said give it a chance you know give give this thing a, a go first i'm not going to pass any judgment on this until i actually get my hands on one hint hint john bickle will you please hurry up <laughs> um yeah, yeah i'm still waiting for my argon eight um which he, nice. he said he would send but it still hasn't materialized i, I i'm wondering who i who else i have to sleep with we can't give an accurate opinion of it if we haven't actually seen one in, no. the, in the flesh, can we? That's, no, that's and as soon, as soon as we do get one, or one of us gets one, then we will um, tell you absolutely our opinion. But I think it, you know, it can be said that um, this is a really nice positive step. It's good to see Modal uh, you know, knocking these out. Um, they're good, high quality, well thought out, well built, and extremely well priced. I think you know, if you look at this compared to a lot of other things in the market right now, Five seven nine, or let's say six hundred, whatever US or or or, or British. Um, yeah, that's that's a fair price for a very powerful is, synthesizer yeah. uh, to yeah. have there. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Right. Well, that's um, Argon Eight. Let's talk about another piece of hardware that's kind of um, popped back into our stream of consciousness, which is um, Moog's Workstat Zero One which I believe was one of these kit things that um, didn't it launch at one of the Moog um, events that they had down in Asheville. Like every year they, they yep. come up with a workshop and th there's a synth. And uh, the works that I think was a year or two ago and uh, they've just now relaunched it with a CV expander, which I think might have been like a, an add-on before, but now you can just buy the whole package. I believe it sells for... 199 and it's a build yourself kit which you know in, when i say build yourself it's you know it's kind of a very simple kind of snap together um i don't think there's any soldering involved no no, no soldering so that's yeah. that's good um 
and you know it has this you know very very simple straightforward moog interface um you know these little direct input buttons here but of course i guess you just hook it up to uh your your modular system and then you've got this cv expander out here which just really i guess opens the whole thing up if you're into uh euro rack and all that kind of stuff um you know with christmas coming up for the the, the synth geek in your family buy them a, a synth they can build themselves i guess um uh, ben any thoughts on this one well yeah i, 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 I I watched the videos on that because I was interested on uh, how difficult it would be to put it together. And I watched a video of somebody assembling it and it was like really easy. It, I could do it. And, and that's, you know, I, I, I hurt myself soldering leads. So this is <laughs> like perfect for me. Uh, it just literally uh, parts of it clipped together. There's a little bit of like you, you screw the uh, circuit board in. That's it. That's about as technical as it gets, really. Cool. Uh, that that CV section that just clips on as well, and then you screw it into place. Right. So it, it, it's really easy. You could probably do it in a few minutes, and it sounds awesome. I think yeah. I, is it, the the sound out of it is incredible for the size of it. The filters are so nice. Uh, it, it it's a must, really. Something yeah. like that just. Just so you can look at it and say, I, I built that, even though it was dead easy. <laughs> yeah. I built, I built that, and um. and then you can stick it in your tunes. And it, it, it does, it's really good. And it's 199 quid. Yeah. I, if I found that on Christmas morning, I think I'd be quite pleased with that. There you a go. Bit, it looks a little bit like flimsy around where those CV connectors are. I think I might right. have liked to have seen that boxed off a little bit because I'd snap them off, I reckon, after a bit. But. Well, I think what might happen is um, you'll find people that will build enclosures. You know, the community is, 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 if it's anything, it's in, ingenious and, in, 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 you know, uh, yeah, come up with some amazing things. Um, I like, I mean, that, that's my first and only ever hand-built synth, the, 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 the NTS-1, which is a, a yeah. it's, it's just a cracking little thing, you know, for, what was it, £99. Um, I, I mm. rarely use it as a synth. I use it more as an effect module because the effects on there are just out of this world. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, it, like you say, it takes about 10, 15 minutes to put that together. Uh, no soldering required. And you just, um, yeah, it's, it's just good, good fun. Michael, can you, um, are you going to look for this in your, yeah, your stocking I, this Christmas? Uh, you know, I uh, maybe I will. I mean, you know, the work stat... In my experience with it was a friend of mine has a very nice music program in a high school here in America, right. and he had several of them, and he had the students put them together as a way of learning synthesis. Mm. And so for me, I think if you have a student or somebody who's like, you know, kind of just starting, it's a great place to start. And like Ben says, it's a great sounding synth. It's like wide open and it's got like this sort of crazy sound. And then there's the far other extreme, which is the guys who are sort of beyond Eurorack and they just have raw components all over the place. <laughs> and they're plugging it in going, like, oh, I need another oscillator, quick! I mean, no one in the closures, no nothing. It's just, all, they're just all losing their minds. So, um, you know, I, I, I think it's great that Moog is, has stayed with this because I think that there are some very cool applications for it. And, you know, and sometimes it's nice to have like a little pocket synthesizer. Sometimes when I play live, I love the little synths mm. because sometimes they just do one thing. Like I have my Yamaha, you know, Reface CS, which is like a absolute must live synthesizer for me. Sometimes having those little boxes and things where it just does a single thing or maybe a couple of things in the course of an evening, it's nice to have. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. There was a guy uh, in one of the videos and he did a demo with like several of the units laid out. And, oh, it was, the, the piece of music is awesome. Mm -hmm. The sound quality is probably, the, the value of all of them is probably just over a grand, you know, but it sounds so good. It was like Lisa Belladonna, you know, that it was that kind of sound. It was really yeah. good. And it comes in an inexplicably large box. Yeah, I, I, I noticed about that. This big. <laughs> yeah, they're, trying to, they're just trying to confuse you. That's it. Yeah, half, half, 
unbelievably a big box, unbelievable, and then it's just a tiny thing on the inside, which is not good. Yeah. yeah, it's it, yeah, aren't they yeah. the best presents to get though? Because it takes forever to get in and oh, look, yeah, it's just tiny. Yeah, right, it's another box inside. Yeah, it's it's a it's a box that mirrors the sound and not the not the actual physical uh, sound. There you go. Yeah, I reckon yeah. that's right. Here comes the marketing bullshit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so yeah, there you go. That's the the Moog Works Stat Zero One, which has been what? relaunched with the CV Expander. Sorry, did somebody? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, what do you think about it, Robbie? You haven't. You haven't um, said I, no. Well, I think um, you know, it's 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 a Moog. It's two hundred bucks. Uh, somebody in the chat room, I think it might have been Sasquatch, said that it's kind of expensive for what it is if you compare it with the likes of say a Behringer New, uh, Neutron or or something like that and yeah I guess it is but I, you know, at the same time there's a cachet with the the name isn't there with the Moog name and uh, the fact that it's a kit as well and you've got you know it, with the seats but certainly with the CV expander that gives you sort of very similar kind of routing options you take you know you take your pick um, you know you get the one that you think is going to be you know, most suitable for you um, would I, if somebody you know was to buy this for me for Christmas to make, um, it would be great. Although I don't entirely see how much I would use it because of that whole CV expander thing on the right there is going nowhere in this room because there's I don't have I'm not in that world and I don't envisage Ooh. myself going into that world anytime soon or at all. So I'm not entirely sure if I get all the use out of it. But as a lovely product and a, you know a piece of you know Moog hardware that you can build yourself and it. You know, has a sound and uh, a bunch of connectivity all of its own. Then yeah, g great, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Look at you. Yeah. So let's see what have we got next. Um, not much. But ten, let, let's keep on the hardware track. And because we have Michael with us, and Michael is the proud owner of serial number 50, 55. 55, Ooh, of, 55. His, of his Profit 5 Rev 4, um, yes, sir. What we're going to we're just going to talk about this because again it's been all over everywhere. Um, sure. I thought we you know we we should talk about this. So um, I'm just going to bring up this screen here, which is Dave Smith's um, post that was on the the sequential forums. Um, I'm not going to go through it, uh, but you know he, they found an issue, and the issue was that uh, they had um, installed a couple of capacitors that weren't meant to be there. And what it does is it rolls off some of the high frequencies, particularly towards you know the top end of the, the 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 range of the keyboard. It rolls off some of those high frequencies, and when people were doing A B comparisons with Rev threes, it was noticeable, I guess, in isolation with a you know a clean pair of ears and and what have you. Um, a lot of people didn't notice, and and now you know. But the thing is, it's not the fact that there's an issue because look, you know, everybody makes mistakes. The thing is, is how they owned it, and they owned it fantastically well. Dave Smith came out literally within a day or so of this kind of coming to light and saying, look, we messed up, this is why we messed up, and this is how we're going to fix it. You can either send us the machine and we'll fix it for you. You can fix it yourself. We'll send you the instructions. We'll send you the, the PCB, so you can just swap out that if you don't want to do any of that hard work yourself. Whatever it takes to fix it, We'll do it, and you know you cannot say fairer than that. Now, obviously, uh, I don't have a Profit Five Ref Four. Ben doesn't have one, but Michael does. And Michael, just tell us. I mean, we, you, we were talking just before we came on air about you know the fact that you said you didn't really notice it, and it wasn't an issue for you. Can you maybe elaborate on that a bit more? Sure. I mean, you know, first of all, I think we live in a funny time because I think we live in a time where I think people are so blown away by anyone taking responsibility or really bringing integrity to something that people are like, wait a second, what are you doing? I don't understand. And so, I mean, Dave can't be Dave without operating at a very high level of integrity. So that's number one. Number two, it was a side to side audio test between the new Rev 4 and a Rev 2. Um, I mean, my Profit 5, I've, you know, had it for like a little over a week now. Um, I've probably put it on five things that I've done. You know, when they said it, I was like, Cayenne, what? What are you talking about? So will I get it fixed by somebody local and we'll keep it as, you know, what, uh, sure, I guess. But I think, um, I, I think more than anything, um, 
I, I'm very, very proud of Dave. I, I've had a long relationship with Sequential. I think this is my fourth profit, fifth profit. I forget, <laughs> but 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 I'm very proud of how they're dealing with it. And I think that all the internet sort of hubbub about this is because people just aren't used to it. I I just um, it's a beautifully done reissue it's very tight the build is great it sounds fantastic um so i mean and i think you know when someone puts this on a bench and they're going to take out the two capacitors i think it's going to take them like five minutes to fix this so yeah. Yeah. um so i you know so at some point will i get it done uh, i'm almost too busy at this point to kind of pull it out and go but but i but i i i think it's great um and i think it's a very limited number too. There's only, I think there's like less than a hundred of them that are actually affected by yeah. this. So, um, and you know, and they're going to sell gobs of these. So I am, um, you know, uh, for me, I'm good. I'll get it looked at at some point, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, beating on the table going, Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. As far as I'm concerned, this is a beautiful instrument. No problem. One question I have for you, why the five and not the 10 for you? <laughs> why did you make that choice? Um, I, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I, um, have you ever seen anyone go to a music store and they're looking at a new poly synth and they put 10 fingers down mm -hmm. <laughs> on a synthesizer? That's me. <laughs> um, right. So I'm trying to imagine of all the TV and film stuff I've done on the records and everything where I have been able to play a chord like that on anything that I've ever done. Right. So in in what I would call sort of the 99.9% .9 of all the stuff that I've ever done ever, five voices are fine. <laughs> it's like, it just, it just is. And unless you're really doing a part where like, you know, the sustain is gonna be like grabbing voices on the way or whatever, fine, mm -hmm. it's whatever. But I've, I've been using a Profit 5 since the early 80s. And so I'm just sort of used to having, have, how the voices like to sort of like hand off to each other and, and and does the red four do exact do it? Does the red four do it exactly the same as the previous models? Exactly models? the same. Oh, that's exactly. Because yeah. there's that famous I mean, is it King is it Kim Khan's Betty Davis eyes where that that little kind of refrain at the beginning is kind of noticeable, but it's part of the character of that sound. It's part of the character of the sound. I mean, and you think about all the songs, you know, where the Prophet Five, you know, is featured, like you know, in the in the air tonight, Phil Collins, yeah. you know, like like you know, there's you could just you just sort of you know reel them off but i think one of the things that i use the profit for a lot is a lot of like comping like sort of tight chords with like three or four notes all mm -hmm. at the same time profit five is fine that's all i need yeah. five voices cool no that's good yeah. and that's absolutely yeah. fine i mean i i personally if if i had you know the cash and i was going to buy one i would go for the 10 because I, I must say, yeah, I am that guy that goes in and tries to, you know, get the bigger sounding chord to, just to see what it sounds like. But I, I do notice, I do notice, like, for example, um, I've got a DX11 uh, back there, and that's yeah. eight voice. And so coming from, you know, some of the bigger synths that I've got in here, and because it's, it's only eight voice, and because it uses certain techniques such as MIDI effects, it doesn't have actual uh digital effects so it has a midi based reverb and a midi based delay right. once you start you know playing with some of the performances that are layering some of the sounds the note stealing just comes straight in and it's it's kind of infuriating particularly if you like if like me i like kind of big long um you know reverby pads or stuff like that it, you could it's noticeable and so having you know the most polyphony and i guess it probably harks back to by the time I was able to afford to, uh, able to afford to buy a a synthesizer, which was like early nineties, um, I went for a Roland, and that had a hundred and twenty eight note polyphony. Oh no, sorry, sixty four note polyphony, thirty two part multi timbrality. Uh, note dropping was never a, a thing. I didn't even know what it was because I could just do anything I wanted and have loads of instruments. It was absolutely fine. And then when you start to, you know, get into the the older stuff, like, you know, half the stuff in this room, and you think, actually, there are limitations, and you have to work around them, but, and that's good, because it makes you a little bit more creative, I guess. But, um, yeah, I don't have the money to buy either a 5 or a 10, so it's really a non-issue. But I, I'm always keen to understand, um, you know, because Simon in the chat rooms just said the 10 voice is not just for big chords, 
but slow ambient pads and and you know yeah. and avoiding you know note stealing that kind of thing everyone's Absolutely. different you know so um everyone's different and everyone does things you know the way they do it but i, I mean honestly um you know i remember the very first time i got a profit five and you're you're playing changes for the qualities of the instrument that you have and yeah. so i'm um, so just you know call me an old uh, an old man or whatever i'm just sort of used to it so yeah no that's cool ben do you want to chip in on anything there or i just agree with what you were saying but i i um it reminded me of a, a situation using this, the Yamaha CX-5 years ago with, with that sequencing. You used to have to allocate how many voices each track would have. Yeah. So you think, oh, well, this is my bass drum. It only needs one. And yeah. <laughs> I'll go with two for the bass so that note will, will sustain properly when it needs to. And you don't really do anything like that anymore, do you? No. You know, it's just, it just things it, tend to work. It's one... You know, I, we could do an entire episode, the three of us, on the Yamaha CX. <laughs> I have one, Rob has one, Ben, you still have yours, Ben? I don't have it anymore, but I, I spent a long time with it. it you know, and, my... you know, because at, at the time, and one of the things, and, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about music, is I love the idea of self-limiting systems. Mm -hmm. So, like, in music, like, the ultimate self-limiting system is a string quartet. Mm -hmm. So you got, everyone's got the same thing. Two violins, viola, cello, go. Yeah. And um, to me, I, I really do think that the limitations make you make different creative choices. Um, you know, this idea that you can get as many voices on everything all the time. I, I, I don't know if that's necessarily a great thing. I, you know, I mean, it's nice to have infinite choices of things. But I think in terms of like letting music breathe and giving and giving like some speciality to, to parts and, and, and just keeping some air around things. I like having some limitations because yeah. I think I think it forces you to make the sounds that you do have with the voices you do have better. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally, Definitely. totally agree. Um, so there you go. That's sequential. Um, got a problem. They fixed it. Everyone's happy. Nobody's. I don't think anybody is upset. Uh, I think certainly if you know if you've spent that amount of money on something and uh, an issue, whether it's a you, know, you consider it a fault or not, um, you. All you can, the least you can expect is the company to respond properly, and they did, and, and that's all. So I think all anyone can ask. Sorry, uh, Inky said in the chat room, if you carry out the repairs yourself, does that invalidate your warranty? Good question. Because, uh, yeah, because yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not the best with the soldering iron. Um, I, I will say because you know, whenever I have anything to do on the fairlights. I get somebody in uh, to do that for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I personally, if if I was a Profit Five owner, I would do what probably what Marshall has done because I wouldn't want to be shipping mine all the way back to the US and then back again. I would just say, let's send me the PCB and I can swap a PCB. That's no problem. So that's that would be the solution. Um, but you know, as, as many people have pointed out, you know, you just need a, a couple of you know snips and a, a desoldering device, and and that's it, and job's yes. done. So um, I wonder, I wonder but it would be interesting. People, yeah, I wonder if some people will choose not to have it updated. It, it might and prove to be more yeah. valuable in can, time. Yeah, can you imagine that the secondhand market it. in a few years' time? You know, yeah. Profit Five Rev Four. You know, un untouched. You know, oh, with unfixed. resistors. Yeah, unfixed. Unfixed. Yeah, there you go. Wow, well, it's like circumcised or uncircumcised. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> A ASM actually did this in reverse, didn't they? They brought out warm mode. Like Dave's trying to get rid of warm mode. I think. And yeah. Take it back to clear mode. It's a feature. That's what we say whenever yeah, we bring yeah. some some new technology out, and it, it does something that you weren't quite. Uh, expecting it's a feature that's what it is um but anyway you know you you take your money you pay your price and uh if you, know, you you do what you need to do but at least they've addressed it so I, th I thought it was worth kind of calling that out uh um for, for the the excellent service last bit of hardware news before we go on to a few software thingies and then we'll talk uh, we will talk to michael about his career in a few minutes time um we should we should get a trailer or a stinger for this one um, because not a week goes by, we don't seem to mention something by um, by Behringer. Um, now this was posted on their Facebook page, um, and it's you know, they've done this a few times before. Like, can you tell what it is yet? 
Um, and you look at this and you think, well, uh, and once you start to pick it out, you start to see a pattern with these, you know, with these rotaries. Um, and then somebody, I think it was Synth Anatomy, uh, posted this comparison picture up uh, with an Oberheim SEM2. So uh, if you look at the the actual SEM controls, the the, VC, the two VCOs, the VCF, and the envelopes at the bottom, you can match those up almost identically on onto that Behringer board. Um, it looks like then on the right hand side they've put the uh, all the connections rather than at the top, but it does look to all intents and purposes like we might be getting a uh, an Oberheim clone from Behringer, which I think you know a lot of people have you know obviously they're doing the OBXA or the UBXA whatever they want to call it. Um, but yeah, this is you know Behringer again doing uh, some some stuff. Obviously, there's going to be haters, there's going to be lovers. What mm. side of the fence do you guys fall on? I'm not sure about this one because it's Tom O'Brien still making these, isn't he? Uh, is he? No, not mm, really. No. Oh well, yeah, it's fine then. It's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> If you can't get them, then it's fine. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought it was like, because Tom, Tom and Dave, they're like synthesizer royalty, aren't they? You know, yeah. you don't, you know, you don't really want to uh, step on their toes, like if you can help it. So, if he, if, if if Tom's not doing it anymore, then yeah, it's it's nice to have that option, isn't it? And yeah. it, it'll be it'll be affordable. It's yeah, whether they get the true. sound right, but uh, going off what they've done previously, I suppose the sound will be in the same ballpark, won't it? Yeah. So yeah, mm. I mean, yeah. It, 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 it surprises me in a way that maybe maybe they have that Behringer. I mean, I think there the, every now and again somebody posts um, links up from uh, patent pages that show which patents and brands Behringer have you know have registered, and I believe that they registered. Oberheim as a brand or as a you know as a as a name as you know a trademark for them or something connected to that and they've done that they've done a few and right. they're not doing anything illegal or wrong because obviously these things are limited to you know by time and and so if they've lapsed and they've not been renewed there is absolutely nothing to stop them from actually doing this apart from the moral question yeah um yeah. but you know if, if I was Udi Berenger I would like be yeah if you got Tom Oberheim, who is what, like 84, I think, at the moment, he probably is not going to be that interested in ramping up a business to sell hardware with his name on. Somebody somewhere will want to license that. Now, he's done some stuff with Dave Smith in the past, in recent past. Um, yeah. Why Why not, you know, say, look, give us some money. You know, we'll pay, pay Tom to use the name, and he gets the credit. Baron to get to, you know, maybe be seen in a slightly better light because they're actually you know rewarding and acknowledging you know the the, the thing that they're plagiarizing um i don't know it's it's a funny old game this thing it it, it is i i think we've gotten into kind of a strange cycle though it's mm. like you know the uh, the mini moog reissue comes out moog is putting it out for four thousand dollars or whatever and everyone's like oh i'll wait for the behringer uh, you know, and it and it's like every time some synth that comes out that everyone feels is like a little bit too expensive, I'll wait for Behringer to do it for, you know, a quarter of the price. You know, this whole thing of them doing their version of the ARP 2600, and it's going to be $599. I'm, you know, I, 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 I don't know what it's going to be in pounds for you guys, but like, you know, I, I got a 2600 reissue, yeah. and, um, you know... As far as I'm concerned, it's like, look, these are all tools. And the bottom line is do the work that you do with the tools that you have. So if you don't have money to go pay for something, then go get something that you can afford and do the best work you can. But this whole thing that people are fighting about, about what's better and I can't believe mm. you have this and all this stuff, it's almost like Behringer is almost like fermenting that kind of conversation. Yeah. When what they what with what they should be doing is saying, look, you know, we're creating something for people who can't 
go out and buy. I mean, like an Oberheim two voice used is like ten thousand dollars. Yeah. So I can imagine like they they would do one and it would be less than a thousand dollars. I I would buy one absolutely to have that quality of sound in my you know in my mm -hmm. studio because I'm not going to pay ten thousand dollars for a two voice. But mm. I, but but this whole hierarchical like this is better than that and whatever. As far as I'm concerned, the only thing that matters is what does your music sound like. End of story. Mm. End of story. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree that's, more. I've got to applaud that. You know, that's dead uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you yeah, know, we've spoken frequently, and, and it's it's discussed frequently in many other places uh, uh, across the internet. That you know, this whole thing with Behringer. Um, bottom line is, if you don't like it, you just don't buy it. If you, right. you know, if you don't want to be involved in that, don't. And and you can have your moral high ground if you want. However, as you say, it's democratized a whole bunch of stuff uh, for people that you know they want that sound they want that functionality here's an affordable way of getting into it and i've said this time and time and time and time again behringer are not the first company to do this no and they will never be the last they're, they're no. just probably doing it the most prominently and i i guess they have a reputation a long-held reputation for plagiarism uh, i don't think that's too strong a word um and i don't think they would deny it but they've done you know they've maybe overstepped the mark a few times or pushed it as far as they can but you know business is business and uh you know if you uh, who was it who said the other week recently on this show you know if you want uh, an arp uh 2600 a genuine arp 2600 you have options you can go sure. and buy it you can buy an original one or you can buy the korg one you have options but if you can't do that, then there is one at five nine nine that will get you as close. And in some, you know, some cases, some people are saying it's closer than the Korg. But you know, I guess it's early days. But you whatever, know, whatever that means. Exactly, exactly. Because no, tw no two twenty six hundreds, whether they're originals or Korgs, are going to sound identical because of the very nature of the thing that's inside them. So, you know, this, whatever. Uh, there are options, and if you well, don't like it, don't buy it. Well, I mean, one of the things that's interesting, I mean, you know, and I'm not taking Behringer's side, mm -hmm. but I think they are servicing a part of the market. Yeah. And I have been on this incredibly long thread that Yamaha has been doing with a bunch of people asking them about like new technology and what should happen. And very quickly, the conversation turned into why not reissue the CS80? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it said, look, you so I see all these pictures from last year, you know, Behringer's doing the CS80 and here's what they're going to do. And it's probably going to be less than a couple of thousand dollars. Why can't you guys do this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, essentially what came back was, uh, you know, they can do whatever they want to do, but like, that's not who we are as a company. That's not what we do. We don't create that stuff. Yeah. And it's like, I, I, I do think that if Behringer finds a market for something and they can sell it, I think that's great. I mean, I, I bought a poly D mm -hmm. I'll, be, I'll be the first person to tell you that. And I bought it for live. So I don't have to take any of this stuff out with me. There you go. So if something happens, like I'm, if I'm playing at a pub or something and it like, you know, falls off a stand or whatever, I'm not going to have a heart attack with a poly D with yeah. any of this stuff. I will. So I mean, you know, so to me, it's like, um, why not? Like, if if you can find what you need and they're providing it for you, I think that's great. Yeah, there's a whole market there for them as well, isn't there? If they make replicas of or clones of of all these famous synths, there's going to be people who have got the originals who who, who will have like a a second <laughs> a, a B team, if you yeah. like that. That, that, that take the hits live, that, that, that go in the back of the vans and everything, yeah. because they're, they're not as valuable. Yeah. But if they, and especially like the, the live environments, like uh, uh, kind of a little bit easier, uh, so you can get away with slight diff tonal differences and things. So it's it's absolutely yeah. perfect for yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a practice that's been done for for decades. You know, people would go in the studio and record with Fairlights. You don't want to be taking that on the road for a number, a whole number of reasons. Yeah, you know, yeah. weight, <laughs> fragility, cost. You know, uh, reliability. So what would happen was that people would take emulators on the road and they just copy things across in the studio and they take the emulators because they were, you know, a, a quarter of the price and lighter, not much, but you know, some. And so it, it's, that's been done. And so, yeah, exactly. You know, using this kind of gear 
if if it's as close as you need it to be uh, in a live environment, then you know, like you say, why why bother? I think there is a you know they're servicing a section of the market that nobody else has been doing. We've said this countless times before, you know, particularly when they were doing you know the Roland stuff like the the one hundred and one, right. you know. We've been banging on Roland's door for decades, saying, "Come on, give us another 101, give us a proper," and they never did. So, you know, here, here it is. There it is, and it's there, there and it's two nine nine, and it's fine. Anyway, we we always kind of end up talking about this about Behringer, and you know, it's not a bad thing, but you know, I think uh, I think we've done that one. Um, okay, tell you what, um, I, actually, let me just get this in. So, this is some local news. Um, Brian okay. Eno, who is a fellow Suffolk resident here in the UK, um, has uh, emerged bearded from his little synth cave um, over in Gelderston um, to come out and support his local pub. Good on you, Brian. And he's uh, he's reported there on the local news here. Um, he's come out to support this pub that's uh, trying to you know trying to survive through. Um, the, the the COVID lockdowns. It's an old lock keepers pub or lock, lock, lock keepers cottage, traditional English pub, and um, you know you wouldn't expect anybody to you know other than the locals to to champion their 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 plight. But good old Brian has come out and um, and pledged his uh, allegiance and uh, and is encouraging us all to to try and help save the uh, the pub. Um, yes, sorry. What does he look like? Oh, he looks ridiculous. That bald head, them glasses, and that grey beard. He's just like. When? What, what do you mean? Brian <laughs> Eno's looked ridiculous for his entire career. This is trademark. <laughs> I, just, I seem to have copied his look somehow. I know. I know. <laughs> we're all. We're all. Did you see him in the seventies when he was wearing the cape and he had the makeup and the hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he's fine now. He's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I keep hoping that one day I will bump into him somewhere because we in this neck of the woods it's it's a very much a, a retirement place for old actors and musicians and stuff and they've all they've all got country piles around here somewhere but Brian despite his incredibly flamboyant name and nature is actually born and raised in this area and so he's never he's never really moved away and he's always been a, a vocal supporter of local things. But I keep hoping that one day I'll bump into him and he'll go, oh, you're that ProSynth Network guy, um, and and say, come round and we'll have a beer and we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, that would, I would just, like, melt. Absolutely. Wow. Just, what a legend. Um, but, yeah, we've got him. We've got Rick Waitman up just up the road, and uh, there's, there's a number of others. Uh, yeah, so this is this is where you want to come if you want to spot old rock stars. This is this is where you come. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that he in. He can play a bit, can't he, Waitman? Oh, Waitman, He's yeah. Yeah, yeah, he he can rival Michael for his um, lightning fast finger chops. Oh, there you go. Yeah, he's not bad. He's not bad. <laughs> he's not either. bad. That Wayland guy. Um, <laughs> bad. So, right. talk, Michael. Let's let's embarrass him uh, further because um, I want to talk to you uh, about you and your career. So, Michael Wayland, um, as billed on his website, is an Emmy Award winning composer, a music supervisor, recording artist, and record executive. Yeah or otherwise known as an incredibly busy man when I discovered just the other day that he's done three New York marathons as well. Just, you know, because wow. uh, you can. Um, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, there, there is so much. We don't have the time, unfortunately, to, to kind of go into everything. But, sure. um, Michael, tell us, what you've, I mean, your name has always been around in, in my kind of periphery and certainly the last year or so, I'm, I feel very honoured to have you know, have this connection that we, we do now. I've known your name and I've seen your name in various places. Where would we know, where would people know you from? Um, you know, if, if I was to say, you know, Michael Whalen and somebody says, who? I say, oh, you know this film or advert or TV show? That's, That's right. that guy. Uh, so... My career started as an advertising guy. So I was doing, you know, music and sound design, you know, in the late 80s. And it kind of got crazy. So I came to New York. I grew up in Washington, D.C., came to New York. And I did a lot, a lot, a lot of commercials. And then in 1990, I did my first TV show. So in, wow, guys. So in 21 years or so, I've done about 800 plus TV shows and I've done two or 3,000 commercials. Wow. Um, and I've worked on about two dozen feature films. 
Um, and then as a music supervisor, I've probably worked on 50 other projects. So there are some projects where I'm um, the music supervisor and I'm the composer, which I prefer because you can, you can, you know, write the score to the songs you need or the songs to the score or vice versa. But um, I think people would know me um, from a lot of the documentary work that I've done. I've, I, for a long time in the 1990s, I was one of the only American composers that was uh, approved by the BBC. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. So, uh, so I was. Uh, so I so, paid for your work, technically speaking. Because yeah. <laughs> wow. Calm down. I owned a piece of him. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, so I did, uh, uh, I did a lot of stuff that you would have seen, and then um, I was signed to Narada um, Records in 1993, and the the first couple of records I did for them were not solo records; they were soundtrack records. Okay. Um, and you know, and I didn't really do my first solo record until 1996. Um, I did a record called Night Scenes mm -hmm. uh, that came out on um, Hearts of Space Records. Um, and it did incredibly well, and it was all over the place. It was incredibly popular in Europe. And uh, that was sort of the beginning of me sort of saying, okay, well, am I going to be an ambient guy? Like, what am I doing? And um, so, uh, yeah, so I think from all those things, my name is sort of all over the place. But I think recently, um, over certainly over the last three or four years, um, I've, I've really focused on my recording career. Mm -hmm. um, I've done five records now i have another one that i'm about to finish um, i'm doing a soundtrack record next year for a feature that i just scored so i'm i have a lot a lot of output and i'm running a record company in california while i'm living here in new york so it's it's crazy time so so in that studio behind you do you have a time machine because how that how on earth do you cram all of this work into you know seven days of a week with just 24 hours it's yeah, nice. I, I mean, and people ask me that all the time, and I, the answer, and I am not trying to be flip or controversial. Um, I schedule it, mm -hmm. so I I write, I make a a time for writing, and I make a time for certain things, and then I stick to it, and then when I stick to it, I get things done. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I spend a lot of time sort of like noodling around, I get a lot of noodling done, but I don't get any work done. So I, uh, I I think, especially in the last 10, 15 years, um, I've gotten very, very serious about my schedule. And like if I if I put something in the schedule, here it is. It's got to be there for a reason. And, you know, and when I do something in a schedule, there's not anything that I let get in the way of it. So it's not like, oh, gee, maybe I'll, I'll you know, I'll write for two hours. It's like I will cancel other things to keep that appointment with myself. So I think it's really about making your creative output just as much of a priority as going to the doctor or the gym or anything else. It's like, you got to make it a priority. And yeah. when you do that, things happen. Do you know, I was envious of you in terms of your, your the, the quality and quantity of equipment in your studio. Now I'm envious of you for your timekeeping methods, because that is one thing that I really, really struggle with. And I, you know, I'm now into my fifth decade and, or just finished my fifth decade and i'm i'm only now kind of realizing that yeah you you really have got to 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 be firm and and structured if you want to kind of get anything done and it's difficult i i really struggle um but yeah that's impressive i mean i'm just looking through uh, you know your your website here and you know for for people you know some of your better known projects that you've listed here uh, for example you know in america the good morning america theme uh, the oprah winfrey show um america at crossroads which you won the emmy for um slavery in the making of america the tv series uh, the hbo network id the verizon corporate logo pepsi international campaigns uh stuff for netflix i mean you know it's really such an impressive resume that you have there it's um it's pretty cool and of course you are you know, you're a recording artist in your own right as well um so you, you say you're working on an album at the moment. What what yep. can we expect from that? Sure. So this has been a weird year because uh, yeah, I did an album in March called Sacred Spaces, which was everywhere. It was on the top of the charts, all over the place. Mm -hmm. I think I did something like 200 interviews about it, <laughs> and I think it reestablished me as somebody who is a composer and a sound designer, really kind of. 
uh, of people say of the highest order, which I think, you know, I, I, I humbly say that's very nice of them. Uh, and then in April, I got COVID. Yes. And I was, uh, and I was recovering from it. And I'm running a record company. And I got some some music from an artist of ours who lives in Malaysia. And the flute was beautiful. I didn't really, really like the track. So he sent me all the logic sessions and I replaced everything. And in three weeks, we had a new album. So, um, and so that came out in September. So that's called Karmic Dreams, which is a lovely, lovely record. Uh, and then uh, I got a kind of a bee in my bonnet to go do something that's like a prog fusion jazz experimentation that's going to sound like Spinal Tap in a second. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, so now I wrote 10 songs and this week uh, Simon Phillips did drums and uh, next week we're doing, we're doing bass on it. And I'm probably going to put that out early next year. Um, and it's like this sort of crazy sort of prog, whatever, whatever, with lots and lots of keyboards. But I, 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 sort of seriously, I think one of the things that happened this year um, is that I've lost nine friends and colleagues to COVID. And then about two months ago, one of my best friends died of a brain tumor. And I think with the pandemic and being here in the lockdown and, you know, and April and May here in New York city was just terrible. Mm. All you heard all day long were sirens and oh, there was just, it was just, it was just horrible. And just, you'd, he, you know, like every other day you'd hear about somebody who was, you know, on a respirator or dying or whatever. And I think that was a big wake up call for me. Yes. I have been a very productive person, but it was, you know, I cannot take any time that I have for granted. I cannot take anything that I have for granted. And so if I have something I want to say, if I have something I want to express, if there's something that I want to do, um, now's the time. Mm. So um, if there's any silver lining to the pandemic that um, is that everyone is home. So if you want to collaborate with somebody, you ring them up and and say, hey, I'm doing a thing. Would you like to, you know, do this? And so, you know, I, I contacted Simon, who's somebody I've always wanted to to work with. And he was wonderful. And he, you know, and we you know, made a time and I got him all the stuff and he sent me this stuff back. Super professional guy. And um, so I, I'm doing that in, on a lot of fronts. I'm, I'm working on an ambient classical thing with a bunch of players from the New York Philharmonic. I'm mm. doing an actual prog band with people from all over the country. So, you know, this is a very, very interesting time, which we may never have again, where people are home and uh, take advantage of it and, you know, reach out to them and say, hey, you know, while we're all in lockdown, let's go do something creative. Yeah. And, you know, and maybe you'll release it, maybe you won't, but it's a, but it's, I think it's a, I can't imagine in your lifetime again, being able to have access to all these people. Yeah. So I'm going, I'm going as hard as I can right now. Yeah. No, I, I completely understand because um, I, I was saying to someone just recently, you know, this whole pandemic thing has been awful for pr pr pretty much everyone. Um, we've all been infe uh, infected. <laughs> well, some of us have been infected. Some of us have been, or all of us have been affected in some way, uh, big or small. But I found that certainly for personally, this this year has actually been one of my most productive and fortunate years because, you know, doing podcasts, doing this. And then just the other week, I was um, asked to do a session on a, a movie soundtrack and all of that that whole project is kind of driven by the pandemic you know the composer yeah. could not get an orchestra into a studio simply because if you even if you had 90 fit people you cannot socially distance an orchestra in a recordable space so he's had to rethink everything and one of those was reaching out to musicians around the world of which i was incredibly fortunate to be asked to be one of them and get people to uh, you know work remotely that way and the process was slick and simple and you know i hopefully delivered something that could be useful but that would not have happened absolutely would not have happened had it not been for this pandemic and so i i hate to say it but it has been of a benefit and i think it will have this other effect of you know people are going to change the way they do things i mean i work from home already have done for the almost the last decade but more and more people are going to be doing that now and realizing hey do you know what actually i can work productively from home and not travel into an office using public transport or my own private transport 
and there will be an impact, a positive impact on things like the environment and so on, so on and so forth. So it really is. I, I completely agree that it, it has been um, a, a benefit to, to many, many people too. Um, it's benefited me as well yeah. because uh, we, we were in uh, electro 80s for 15 years uh, and there were, there were like pr problems within the band uh, but we could never find a clear run to sort all this out. It, like COVID's provided us with that that break in everything. So, we, you know, we, we're, we're able to sort out the issues and then when things finally go back to normal, everybody's happy. So th there is... You know there is positives to be found in in a terrible situation as really. um as, as mark hollis said is what you make it and yeah, you know yeah, if yeah. somebody gives you lemons make some lemonade um you know that's, that's the way you got otherwise you're just going to sit there and and things will go to 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 shit, you know but there well, there's, you go. A lot, there's a lot of people that i have heard from who are victims of what's happening right now mm. and that I think is the worst thing you can possibly do. It's like, I've had COVID, I'm not a victim of it. Like I had it, now I don't have it, I'm getting on with my life, I'm being responsible, here we go. So long story short, it's like, like you said, it, it is the way you make it, but I think it has everything to do with how you see it. Because I think, like, I, you know, I think context is decisive in how you see your life. And so it's like either the pandemic is happening to you as an artist and you throw your hands back and be like, oh, well, I couldn't possibly be creative now. Or, mm -hmm. like you said, you, you do see that there are a little tiny silver linings here. Yeah. And that, like, our ability to come together as a community and our ability to collaborate and to, like, use technology and to, to create things that have never been done before – um, like this album I'm working on right now, it never would have happened if it wasn't for the pandemic. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. No way. Because I wouldn't have time to say, hey, gee, by the way, I'm going to go do like a crazy hybrid prog jazz thing. <laughs> okay. And it's like, and I'm, and I'm not doing something to do something. I'm doing something that was like in the back of my mind going, wow, wouldn't it be cool if. Yeah. And so what I'm doing is I'm I'm literally like knocking down all the entire list of wouldn't it be cool if I did fill in the blank. Yeah. And this is one of the blanks I had. Excellent. No, it's a great philosophy. So um, tell us about your 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 process uh, and and uh, the equipment that you have there and, and how you go about using it because I mean just in in this camera shot you know we can see a Schmidt we can see a Moog one we can see the corner of a Prophet five we've got the the Carp twenty six hundred there's a lovely piano there's a mini Moog is that is that the Poly D behind you no that is that is that, actually a reissue a reissue model D no yes. there you go so I stand corrected so you have some impressive and looking at your kit list uh, on your website you know that's an impressive amount of equipment. What's your, your process for, for working? I mean, are you completely based in the door? If so, which one do you use? Do you use one or two? You know, what's your, your process for making music? And I guess it's different for, for different projects. It, it, it's completely different for different projects. For Sacred Spaces, I spent months creating sounds before I wrote any music. Mm -hmm. So I spent almost three and a half, almost four months and I made about 850 sounds um, across a whole range of things. Um, I use the Kaima system a lot as a sound okay. design, as a processing engine, which I highly recommend if you guys don't know what it is, yep. go to simplexound.com, very nice. Um, but I've been using you know, Kaima for 20 years. I was a, um, a Sinclair guy back mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and that's become my sound design thing. So the answer to your question is every single project is different because, you know, like on this, uh, this project that I'm working on now, it actually started with me and the piano and write melodies. Mm -hmm. Sacred Spaces started with a mountain of brand new sounds. Um, Karmic Dreams, which is the, the duo record that I did with uh, Blue Monk with the, the flute that came out in September, that is just literally out of the box. I didn't, I didn't use a single hardware synthesizer in the entire room. I, I literally just used all VSTs and here we go. So I like doing things that are A, different, and B, challenge myself. Like mm -hmm. um, I, I just finished working on a commercial here in America 
and I gave myself a little challenge where I was going to use one synthesizer for the entire thing mm -hmm. because they wanted something that was very minimal, very simple. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I could throw a million colors on it or I could give myself, and we were talking about this 20 minutes ago, a self-limiting system. Okay, yeah. I'll give myself a piano and one synthesizer. Can I do this job? Can I get it across? Is it gonna be the level of professionalism that I want it to be? And I think, I think giving yourself little creative challenges like that, I think that friction helps. Mm -hmm. So my process is different every single time I sit down because I want it to be. But people always say to me, well, well you know, if you've got all of these you know, soft sense, then why do you have all of this stuff? The answer is really simple. I think when you are on, you know, playing a keyboard and you are twiddling the knobs, you're going to make different choices mm -hmm. than if you're doing something on a piece of software. And and let me just catch everyone before they freak out and they start like writing all kinds of crazy stuff in the, in the chat. It's not better choices. It's different choices. Yeah. So you're sitting down and I'm going to make different choices because my finger is literally on a knob and I have that, that, that feedback loop between my hand and the sound I'm hearing and playing the feel of this keyboard versus the Prophet 5 keyboard versus my Montage 8 master keyboard. Like you're just going to make different choices. It's just, it's, 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 it's mechanics. It's mm. being a human being. So I like having these different options because I'm gonna make different choices at different times. The question is, do, do you create enough time and enough creative structure around yourself to actually get the most out of these instruments into the projects you're doing? Because if I'm working on a commercial or a TV score and someone says, hey, by the way, uh, I'm giving you this, this picture now, I need something in three hours, which is something that happened to me last week, <laughs> I get it at 10 o'clock in the morning. They want it at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Not kidding. Um, I'm going to make different choices. I'm not going to be able to sit there, you know, with the Moog 1 for an afternoon and sit there and really get the fil filter perfect. It's yeah. like, so So I, I think um, I think part of it is going to be, do I have a time? Part of it is, what kind of structures do I have? And then part of it also is giving myself a creative challenge to say, how can I be fulfilling on the creative brief and giving myself a little bit extra how can i continue to keep pushing the walls out sure that's no that's that's really really interesting and I, I like you know what you said you know it's not it's not better it's not worse it's just different and right. you know you use the tools that, that that fit i think you know and also what you said about um you know spending time you know for for one project you spent months just creating sounds Whereas you know other projects you know demand that you come up with a melody or, or you know, no. a, a piece in three hours you know that, that that will shape the way you do things. Ben, have you asked Michael? Yeah, quite a few things from uh, from that then. But when you um, said that you made up, was it sacred spaces you made up the sounds for before you started? How how did um, oh. How did you kind of visualize the whole project? Like when you was making the sounds, did you think, right, I'm going to use this on, on track three and this is going to be the basis of, uh, is that how you went about that? I, ben, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say under sort of normal sort of, I have a project and I have a deadline, yes, I would do that. But for Sacred Spaces, I made a whole bunch of sounds with no idea how I would use them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was wonderful. It was absolutely astounding. And what's really interesting is I'm still using a bunch of those sounds on this new project because A, I love the way they are, and B, they were made, like I use them so differently on Sacred Spaces than I am on this new record. I, I challenge anybody to say, well, that's, that's from track three or whatever. <laughs> so, I, so, I, 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 so this idea that you would be creating sound design as an absolute is wonderful yeah, like because yeah. because it, it's so hard to be like okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna make a bass sound today and here's what the bass sound and here's what it needs to be and my response to that is how do you know yeah. how do you know what the bass needs to be mm. unless someone sends you a track and says well you see the way you know the drums work with the bass okay well i want to do something sort of like that and so they send you a piece of temp music yeah okay but 
But for my own music, I try very hard to not get too attached and say, okay, this must be X. Because if that doesn't happen, all of a sudden, this bass sound can become a lead sound. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Because why not? Because I'm the person who decides. Because I think at the end of the day, the ultimate, like, well, I think the ultimate definition of a composer is someone who makes choices, full stop. So yeah, you've, yeah. Got, you've got to be willing to make those creative choices and not let your gear sort of influence you or trick you into doing something that you think you're supposed to be doing. It's like, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't, I don't care what your little panel says or whatever. <laughs> so, 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 so long story short, I think it's important that if you are designing sounds that there's no rules, you don't have to use them in any particular way. There's no like, okay, well, so-and-so did it like this. Therefore I must do it like that. No, total freedom. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and what's your um, so, say you were working on a short movie, say? <laughs> How would you go about the process of that? Would you would you view it through a few times, tinkle along with the piano to get some moods, or it, what? What's your kind of working procedure? Um. Well, one of the things that I do when I'm working on a film is I talk to the director and and I try to get a sense of how involved they want to be at the beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, you know, the feature that I scored this year, I did with a very, very experienced director. His last film was nominated for an Oscar or a documentary, and he's incredibly experienced. And so I had a lot of freedom in terms of how we did things. Um, I just did a short film for someone who just got out of college and they're super nervous and they're just like, you know, any, anything is, you know, every choice you make, you know, is, you know, is, is scrutinized and whatever. So I think, I think your relationship with the director, I think is crucial. Um, so I think that's the first one, but once you get a sense of how that's supposed to go, um, I'm not really a tinkler. I mean, I know, I know. There's a lot of people who like improvise to picture and they yeah. do stuff and whatever. Um, I'm a note taker. Um, right. I, yeah. I, I, I spot things with kind of within an inch of their life. Um, and the short film I just I scored a couple of weeks ago was a comedy, and it had a, and the way it was done with the timing was very odd. It's a very funny movie, but it, it wasn't like set up punchline set up punchline set up punchline it was you know a scoring inside of a very sort of complicated scene and ultimately what i decided to do musically was actually stay away from the dialogue in terms of the timing and i just sort of created a vibe that sort of just sort of framed the scene and sort of gave you permission to say this is going to be funny guys here we go mm -hmm. go ahead and then it's not it's not stepping on or dealing with the acting or the timing at all. Because I think reading cinematic language is crucial. I, I mean, I, I remember uh, meeting John Williams back in the 90s, and we, we, we spoke for a, a while about, um, about scoring, and it was like this sort of like kind of amazing sort of a, a moment, whatever. And he always said that the best music, film music, is a little behind. Oh. It's a little behind. It's a little. It's okay if something yeah. is. It's okay if it's something is just a reaction and it's just behind. Because if you're Mickey Mousing something and it's right on top of the picture all the time, what you can do is you can actually be taking away from the acting. You can be taking away from the experience of it versus having music that lets people act and do what they need to do. And then you can actually create a second or third dimension in the scene by being a moment late. It's yeah. okay. mm. And you're putting down a color and then you can set up the next gesture by being a little bit early, but you're not tipping your hand about where the conversation is going to go. Yeah. So, so, I mean, cause John is a master at like, you know, cinematic language and he, and he's, he's like, look, you can always tell if someone's a new composer because the music is always sort of like waiting to dive on every moment in a, in a scene. Mm -mm -mm. You gotta, yeah. you gotta, you gotta, you gotta chill. It's gotta be just behind. It's like, mm. and that, and that advice has changed my life. 
As yeah. I how I score things, the sounds I use, everything. It's very yeah. interesting. Very good. And my final question for this this particular bit: if if you were like trying to uh, give a definitive example of uh, of Michael Whalen's scoring, the style, uh, and something that you think, yeah, that's me. That that is that that it, it sums me up in everything. I'm really proud of that. What would it be? Uh, well, this new film that I have coming out, there's a, it's a film called Exaltation. It's going to the Sundance Film Festival here in America. It's going to be out in 2021. Um, it, it, I think it has some of the best scoring I've ever done on it. Um, but I would say that I, I think the, the sort of the sum of the best of my writing as a composer would probably be Sacred Spaces. So if you go and you and you find Sacred Spaces in terms of the sound design, how it's put together, the mix, the whole thing. Uh, and it also happens to be the only recording I've ever done that is on vinyl. Oh, so right. you, you, can, you can go to Amazon and you can buy it on vinyl. We did a whole you know, analog lacquer thing. That, that was a whole like journey in itself. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm incredibly proud of how the whole thing came together. So I'd say if, if you want to listen to one thing that's Michael Whalen, that's the thing. There you go, kids. Right. You heard it here first. Sacred Spaces, um, which is available, I believe, on all major uh, streaming and download channels. And, of course, as you said, physically on uh, is it CD as well as vinyl? CD as well as vinyl for, for, for those of you who still live in the 90s. So it's yeah, fun. yeah. Cool. <laughs> I should be looking for the vinyl version. Um, I just have one more question before we um, sort of nip back to some of the, the news topics for the week. Um, a few years ago, when I was kind of beginning this, this fetish of mine with with Yamaha and uh, FM synthesis and DXs and what have you. Um, I was speaking to a producer friend in LA and uh, I was asking him some questions and he said, you know who you want to ask? Ask Michael Whalen. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, because I know that name. Um, what, if if you can, you know, what is your connection? And have, it clearly goes back some way with Yamaha. Do, what kind, yeah. what, can you explain what that? Sure. I, I mean, I uh, in the '90s, I got as uh, you know, I became one of their artists, and you know, and they've they they've been very nice to me. They've you know, my big recording sessions in New York, they always get me a piano. Nice. Um, you know, you know, like uh, I would say, most of my most important gear, whether it's the montage or you know my piano or whatever, is always a Yamaha because of the way it feels. And and there you go. But I, I would say. Um, and this is like talking right at where you are, Rob. My first major synthesizer in my life was a Yamaha DX1. Mm -hmm. So I actually bought one wow. in 1985. And, um, and at that point, um, you know, I was in college, I was delivering pizza, I had saved money for a year and a half, and I spent every dollar plus $200 my mother gave me. And I bought a DX1 and a road case, and I was like, what? the hell have I done, but it's fine. So, <laughs> so, but, but, but it was really the beginning of um, cre having an instrument that scared the crap out of me because I had no idea what it was. And then I started reading um, the, you know, what John Channing wrote about FM digital and, you know, all that stuff at Stanford and all that stuff. And I started reading about Fourier analysis and how all this worked and all this stuff. And so at a certain point, the algorithms made sense to me because you don't want to have infinite choices, so they made some choices for you. So once I started getting that, the DX1 became a sound design machine for me. And so in the early days, I was still in college and I was sending data cartridge uh, to Eric Persing in California okay. saying, hey, I got some DX7, DX5, DX1 sounds. What do you think? And whatever. So like even in college, I had gotten sort of crazy about uh, designing sounds. And so for me, it's always been about creating sounds. It's always been about uh, doing something that's unique because and, and, and I'm not being critical. I'm not being critical. I, I, but I think it is very, very, very tough to call yourself a synthesis if what you're doing is going into Omnisphere, picking out a preset and playing it. I think that makes you a keyboardist, 
certainly, but I don't think that makes you a synthesis. I think a synthesis is somebody who's willing to, you know, open the boot, get in there, you know, and, 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 and start developing a sound and, and doing some things that maybe have never been done before. And um, so for me, I, I think, I think part of being a composer has always been about how do I set myself apart sonically from other people? Mm -hmm. And so whether that was with, you know, the FM stuff, which I loved, and then I went into the Sinclair, which as you know, has got a crazy FM digital section. And yeah. so like, I'm crazy about that. Um, so, and I have thousands and thousands of Sinclair sounds, but the, the bottom line is, is that I think it's, I think it's important that you create a palette of sounds that are yours. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who did that 20 years ago and they're still using the same sounds. I get our... but, but, but on the other side, I think, I, I think it's very important to have some, something that you can point to and someone can listen to it and go, yep, there it is. Yeah. Yep. Like, like one of my favorite film composers is Thomas Newman. Mm -hmm. And he has a palette that shows up a lot in his movies. And I, and I love it. I love this idea that he creates kind of a universe for himself. And then he sort of tweaks it against the cinematic language against whatever movie he happens to be working on. I just, yeah. I love this idea that he has such a clear sonic voice for himself. And so for me as a composer, I think that's something we should all be striving for. And ultimately, I think that's what it really is to be a synthesis. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. yeah. Powerful stuff, that, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just looking at some of the comments in the chat room and people are getting huge amounts of inspiration from what you've been saying. And I, I know I certainly have. So really, really, really appreciate um, your, your comments there. Um, let's, go, let's, let's go and give Michael a break um, and let's talk about some, some other stuff. Uh, that's been happening in the world. Um, I was going to ask about physical modeling, and did you ever get into the Yamaha physical modeling stuff? V01. Yeah. V01, best of the, one of my favorite keyboards of all time. Yeah. I sold it, and at the next day, I called the guy back, and I was like, I will buy it back from me. He's like, nope. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, such yeah. a so great. So, so great. Yeah. So the reason I ask is, I mean, you know, I have a thing about physical modeling, particularly acoustic modeling. And um, I think we've spoken about um, the, the Italian company, uh, Audio Modeling, who um, in recent years have come up with this SWAM engine, which stands for Synchronous Waves Acoustic Modeling. And it's an incredibly powerful and clever system that they've developed. Um, and they do these different instruments. So there's the clarinet, there's a the saxophone, there's flutes, there's double reeds, there's strings, there's brass, and you can buy bundles of, you know, the different types or everything for about fourteen hundred dollars. Um, it's uh, they're really really powerful things, and I you know suggest that if you are interested, go and check uh, some of their videos out. I know Doctor Mix did one because you know they're, they're Italian. I'm Italian. Doctor Mix is Italian. And he went over there and he thing with them and you know some of it's just a stunning stuff so it's not cheap because it's you know it takes a lot of work but if you are into your ios apps um you might be familiar with geoshred you know we featured this when it came out on the show this is uh, a, an application from jordan rudess's company um uh, or a company i don't know if he owns this or whether he's involved he's heavily involved with them anyway but they've now brought um, SWAM-powered instruments into the the GeoShred environment, and it's incredibly this powerful is an stuff. Note for how to get started with the GeoSwam instruments, and you know, there's there's all sorts of there's different. There's a lot of information. There's the violins, there's the, the brass, below, there's the, you know, the strings, and it really does you know open up um, a level of expression with a level of quality of sound that um, these these instruments provide. So this is now available. These are available as um, like uh, in-app purchases, and they're about twenty, twenty-five bucks, I think, a piece. I think some are more expensive than others. Um, but I thought this was, you know, a really nice, interesting development in terms of both acoustic modeling and this kind of uh, performance application. Do you use um, iOS applications or stuff like that, Michael, at all? I do. Uh, I I actually do. I actually am using Amplitube on. Uh, I am distorting my mini Moog on a solo that I have because I, yep. I I have I have to actually be just 
like Jordan as much as possible. So there you go. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I'll say about physical modeling, I mean, because I, I have my C15, the nonlinear lab C15, which is also has a lot of physical modeling on it. It requires philosophically an entirely new way of performing on the instrument. Yeah. If you think you're gonna sit down and just sort of like blow through things on a keyboard the way you always have, try again. So I, what I love about the GeoShred thing is the keyboard they have, the interface they have, which is really cool, and then, and they have like, you know, the, the 3D pressure and all that stuff, it's it's very, very cool. And what I like about it is, is that it, it forces you to think differently about how to use the sound. So like I have like a, a little rolly keyboard here on, you know, right here in my studio. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like having alternate controllers for things like that because um, I don't think you can really access half, maybe even two thirds of what these physical modeling instruments can do on a traditional keyboard. Yeah. So if you guys want to check it out, you know, it's great. You buy the sounds, do the swam thing. And, you know, and I've checked out a lot of that stuff, but have something to play it on, mm -hmm. which will give you as much control as possible. The Rolly is great. The GeoShred keyboard is great. There's a couple of other alternate controllers, which are great, but you really, really want to have as much control over like poly after touch and all. I mean, well, there's, there's a million parameters and you can also change what gets triggered by what. So yeah. there's, it, it, it becomes a little complicated, but once you get it the way you want to practice with it, yeah. because you have to actually look at it like you're kind of taking yourself back to school from a performance standpoint. And even if you have, you know, lots of dexterity on a keyboard, slow down and just give yourself enough time to get used to it. Cause once you do, it's awesome. It's mm. really, really, really cool. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying because, um, you know, I've got the, the call Prophecy up there. And I remember when I got that, um, and I got that specifically because it did acoustic modeling. I mean, yeah, the virtual analog stuff was great, but it was the fact that I could, you know, do trumpets and trombones and clarinets and, and variations thereof. And I am not a keyboard player by any stretch of any imagination. I'm as far away from you, Michael, in terms of those skills as you could possibly be. Um, but when I play the prophecy or try to play it, I actually feel more at home and I actually feel that the, the, the music that I make with it is better than if I'm playing just a regular synth or, you know, or sample or anything. And, I don't know whether I, I've often wondered why that is. Is it because you know the the keyboard is uh, it has aftertouch? You've got the ribbon controller. You've got the multiple wheels that all do. You know they all affect those kind of natural timbres and and um, nuances that you get. Um, is it because it's monophonic, so it's very difficult to kind of you know hit you know a couple of bum notes in a row? You know, you, you, it it just it just seems that it brings something out of me as a very rudimentary keyboard player that actually like the stuff I, I, when I play that thing, I actually really kind of like what I do. Um, and because I'm a drummer, that's, that's my thing. I, I don't know whether it's because of that nuance and feel that, that I've, I've, I've never really kind of put my finger on, on that, but I completely agree that if you're playing modeled instruments, you've got to have something a bit more than just a regular keyboard controller, even if it's just some of these, you know, faders and, and, and controllers, or, you know, something like a Roly uh, uh, Seaboard. And I think MPE is going to be a really big thing with physical modeling because it allows that, you know, real granular level of, of uh, stuff. Um, what about the Hydra synth? Do you reckon that you could get away with it using the Hydra? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually have a Hydra synth right below me. It's right here. It's so... Uh, the the proximity of of the keyboard to where I create music every day tells you how important it is. The hydrosynth is my in my uh, I'm in the middle of writing a review of it right now. Right. In my personal opinion, is the best of the size of twelve hundred dollars that anyone has ever made ever. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually think the hydrosynth actually would be terrific with modeling because. Um, you know, you're talking about a keyboard that has poly aftertouch beautifully done and that assignable, that assignable um, uh, ribbon controller. Yeah. It's like, it's it, it's terrific. So yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big, big, big proponent of the Hydrosynth. Yeah, it, well, it has to be the biggest success story in, in synth hardware for, I don't know how long, it's just amazing. Ben, yeah. um, 
Geoshred, physical modelling. Yeah, it sounds incredible, doesn't it? it, it it's totally realistic. Uh, uh, like Jordan does a brilliant job of demonstrating it as usual. Uh, you, it just makes you think, oh yeah, if I got that, I'd sound like that as well. But obviously, I wouldn't. You know, <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> there's, there's some real serious skill going on there. But it's brilliant, and you're getting these uh, high quality sounds from uh, Swam. Is it? Yeah. yeah. You're getting them now as well yeah. included. Yeah, superb. Yeah, definitely, definitely looking into that. Um, I think you can get the full pack for like seventy, seventy pounds. Yeah, I, I, I said they're about twenty something. They're, they're actually fifteen bucks a pack. Yeah. So yeah. The, yeah, you get the cello or the clarinet or the oboe, and I guess you can buy bundles as well as you can with um, the other stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of as you know, physical modeling. I, I, m more because. I don't want it to sound exactly like the instruments that, you know, I don't want it. It's great to have an authentic trumpet that responds to pitch bend the way a trumpeteer would glissando through or, or, yeah. or, or step yeah. through the notes um, that you can control the amount of breath that goes through and the, and the different timbres that, that that delivers. But also the fact that you can take elements of, you know, a brass instrument and combine them with elements of something that you couldn't do like a you know a resonating body of a guitar yeah you know you, definitely. you know yeah. it's so it's just these kind of weird hybrids and you know i guess that comes from you know my my love of sampling where you can combine all these different things to come up with something that you could not have in in real life um so yeah it's uh it's it's definitely interesting i'm, I'm keeping a close eye on this swam stuff because you know i'm, I'm looking I, I i would love to get a vl um or if <laughs> A VP one one. I think I told you the other week. A VP one wafted under my nose very briefly a few weeks ago in Japan, and there was just absolutely no way a that I could afford it or b that I could ship it or want to ship it from Japan um, for risk of it, you know, not arriving in one piece. However, um, you know, there I, I still you know hold out hope that either I'll get to go to Hamamatsu and steal the one that they've got in. Uh, in Innovation Road, or I'll, um, I'll, you know, happen across a grandma whose uh, husband has just passed away, who bought one on a whimsy, you know, 20, <laughs> 25 years ago, and then stashed I'll, it in the loft. I'll, I'll tell you a story, a brief story, which you may, you guys may have talked about, maybe you didn't, but when Yamaha put together Innovation Road, there was a whole bunch of synthesizers they didn't have. Mm. So Yamaha had to go to the open market yeah. and buy them. Yeah. So, like, I know for a fact they bought their CS80 from a friend of mine in New Jersey at Three Wave Music, and, um, you know, and they had to go out and buy the X1, and they had to go out and do this and that and whatever. So, like, I'm sorry. Like, to me, uh, you know, this idea that they wouldn't have a single model of, you know, of everything that they've ever built is kind of amazing to me. Yeah. It's I just like, but, uh, but it's supposed to be amazing, the... Uh, I saw some of the videos and like I would love to go there, but it's just, yeah. but it's just amazing to me that like even something like the VP is it's so rare yeah. that Yamaha had to go out and go and purchase one at some unbelievably exorbitant price. Yeah, well, there's the t I mean I've I've just picked up the FS1R which I've been looking for for ages to get at a reasonable price, and one of the reasons why in the last few yeah. years prices and availability uh, of the FS1 have, have shot through the roof and the availability has become very low is because when they were developing the montage they needed a development machine for the FM engine and they had to go out and buy a stack of those to to get for the you know for the developers to use and so yeah i mean they i know Nate Nate has been um really busy over in California when he's been setting up his kind of like mini version uh, of of you know the, the the music space that he's got there and they've had to buy in you know DX1 and a VL and you know all this so yeah, it's it's weird that they've had to go and re, kind of rebuy their stuff, but yeah, it's there crazy. you go. Yeah, crazy world. Um, so there you go. That's uh, Geo Shred version five um, now with SWAM based instruments. Let's talk about something else that's kind of, I guess, related in that, and that's um, AAS's uh, Chromophone three, an acoustic object synthesizer, and, and this caught my eye again for the same reasons as it it, it has elements of this kind of uh, acoustic modeling uh, going on um so it's mainly about kind of um struck 
it, it's very i guess in, in a way it's kind of similar to the vp one it, it, it kind of um focuses on the the struck percussive type natural sounds but it seems like a really great little um piece of software that uh, at the moment is currently half price at 99 bucks uh, and i believe that if you go on somewhere is it plugin boutique i think they might have uh, an extra discount on that at the moment but this is a really really nice um instrument let me just see if i can get the uh, the video up uh, for our viewers and it's just going to do it in this little window which is really annoying Let's see if i can just expand that because that's rather small on the screen but of course my brows will now say no you have too many tabs open oh well let's forget that um but yeah aes chromophone 3 um looks like a really neat little software package uh huge amount of presets in there but plenty of tweakable um uh, elements that you can mess around with different resonators different noise generators and mallets and all sorts of uh, wonderful things um Ben, did you get a chance to have a look at this? And if so, did you have any uh, thoughts or opinions? Yeah, yeah. I um, I started off watching the videos and listening to the demos, uh, and then I realised that you could download a fifteen day trial, right? Uh, which I downloaded and it installed dead quick. Mm -hmm. It was really easy to install, and it sounds great. It, it's it really does excel excel at. at those like struck kind of plucky sounds it it, it, it seems to have uh, a, a character and a punch that I, I, I don't think i've ever really seen that kind of punch from anything right it it, it, it literally like comes out the speakers and it's in front of your face the aggressiveness of this initial attack is is so strong um and I reckon it, uh, some of the, the sounds that I was flicking through would just cut straight through a mix. You know, they, yeah. they'd, they'd just, without any messing about, they'd just be there, yeah. like floating, <laughs> floating in that centre space. A great, a great thing. It does get a, it, it's a very specific instrument, yeah. I'd say. And you, you would have it there for a specific job and just get it get it out for that for those instances but it, it's really good at mm. what it what it, it intends to do it is really good at it yeah, yeah. I, I know michael i only sent you a link to these about a day or two ago but have no, you no I, I i did my i did i did my homework oh. and, uh, and one of the one of the things that i think is important and this is sort of a broader conversation that i'm going to bring right back into this is that everyone is always talking about workflow and what do they like to do and all that. Um, Object-oriented programming is a very specific kind of sound design. So like on the Kama system, you can actually put together different objects and you can put together different processes and you can actually link them together, literally, mm -hmm. graphically. So it is, at least as far as I'm concerned, when I look at this, it's a very familiar kind of interface. For people who aren't used to working that way, it will take a little bit of time to get used to it. Mm -hmm. But like Ben says, like with, especially the percussive sounds, like, you know, like you're beating on a big piece of metal or whatever, and you're getting like these weird sort of like tuned sounds like you've never heard before, um, it's fabulous. Yeah. It's really, really, really cool. The other thing that's also really, really nice for is to actually use it under something where you're not exactly sure what it is. So, for example, on a lot of my music, I will use a lot of non-tonal sounds to actually sort of surround and frame the tonal sounds that I have. So I'll use like, you know, voice sounds that aren't necessarily in a pitch, or I'll use metal sounds or sort of ambient sounds that aren't necessarily pitch driven that can actually help uh, sort of push forward the tonal stuff. This is a could be a really, really cool instrument for creating non-tonal sounds mm. that you can control and you can put it into an environment. So mm. another, another idea for everybody. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. I mean, I was working with something that was sent to me um, that was very percussive and very atonal. There was there was just there was one percussive element in there that seemed to be a D uh, or something. Like, uh, and 
And it was very difficult to actually, you know, I was being asked to add to this and it was just really difficult for me to get my head around working with all this percussive stuff until I actually thought, instead of trying to do something against it, try and do something with that. And so I added more yeah. percussive type stuff and it kind of worked. Um, so, you know, who knows? But um, yeah, just to say that the, this retails for 199 it's currently on offer for 99 But if you go to the wonderful... Uh, let me just bring this up on screen. The wonderful plug-in boutique, which I I must say, every now I don't always shop there, but they don't have to do some cracking deals. And you can now buy uh, Chromophone 3, the full version, for $74.95. So that's even less than uh, buying it direct. Um, or if you want the um, the complete um, module with all of the sound packs, it's only $150, which is half price. Um, the upgrade is only thirty three ninety five, and of course those sand packs are uh, fifteen pounds each. So yeah, Plug in Boutique um, have always got some great offers going on, and they're one of those places where um, when you buy stuff, you accumulate points, and then you can convert points into to cash discounts. So that's always good. Um, so yeah, that's Chromophone Three from AAS Applied Acoustic Systems. Uh, you can find out more on their website, which is Applied Hyphen Acoustics. Dot com. Um, let's take a look at the last little news topic here before we start to round up the show. This is just a little one, but it's one that I I'm, I never thought I would say this, but I am a fan of garage band or garage band, depending on which part of the or which side of the Atlantic uh, you come from. Um, but it's just been updated to version two point three point nine, and it has added to some uh, some features that are quite. Uh, impressive so maximum song length at the default tempo has been in increased um, over three times from 23 to 72 minutes that might be useful to some people um, there's a whole bunch of downloadable keyboard collection sound packs with over 150 loops and 50 instrument patches including pianos organs and electric pianos um, you can do quick start recording just by um, holding down the garage band app icon in your iPhone or iPad and it's just you know this this application as like i said i never thought i would you know be a fan of making music on a mobile device but i often find myself with an idea that i just want to scratch down somewhere and this is perfect and in fact i've actually come up with stuff when i've been bored i thought oh i'll just play around with the, the you know garage band and I've come up with stuff that I didn't even realize I, you know, had it in me. And I've come up with, you know, using their automatic strum features or the bowing features on the string instruments or the 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 um, the drum kind of the the AI drum stuff that comes up with a little thing for you, and then you can build on it. And then I've just taken it and you know you save it in the cloud. And when you get back home, you fire up Logic or, or GarageBand at home on the Mac. It's there. You can expand on it. You can do all sorts of wonderful things. It's just so simple and intuitive and of course it's free which is the crazy thing you know if you are an apple uh, uh iphone or ipad user it's free it's there why would you not use it um and if you've got a mac at home then you know your chances well garage band on the mac is free as well so you can you can use that or you can just take it straight into logic i mean it's just for me it's a no-brainer but um are you a garage band garage band user michael I'm a Logic Pro, okay. X, like Jedi. So I, uh, uh, I switched from using um, Pro Tools as my sequencer about seven years ago, and I the best money I ever spent was getting a lesson on how to use Logic. Mm -hmm. I went to a weekend course here in New York City, and I walked out going, "Oh, wow, this is cool." <laughs> so. Um, uh, but uh, I have, I will admit to this, you know, to this worldwide audience that I have used Garage, this is how Americans say it, GarageBand, <laughs> uh, uh, especially for a lot of things that I need to do on the fly. So, mm -hmm. um, like if I'm, I'm working on something, I have to go to Los Angeles a lot, or, um, and, and I, I, if I just want to throw something down, it's a wonderful notepad. And the fact that it can just seamlessly just go right into logic is, it's it's great yeah yeah i mean i, I was um and i still do use uh reason propeller well it's not propeller it's reason studios um right and there was always talk in the in the community and you know, with the company that they were going to 
do something that was uh, mobile as well, so you could you know leap between the two. And I was like, oh yeah, that'd be fantastic because I was so I was such a big reason user, and they came up with something and it was called Figure, and it was just like a loop thing where you had like drums, bass, a lead, and a, a melody, you know, some kind of chord, chord, something, and it was just a loop thing, and you couldn't import you know the files; it had to be audio. And then they came out with, uh, what do they call it? Is it Reason Compact or Reason Mobile? I'm not entirely sure what they call it now. Uh, Reason Compact, um, where you can export the files, but only in a very limited way. Whereas yeah. GarageBand, it's just so, you know, it's just like everything I brought over. I, you know, I created a piece that had lots of strings in it, lots of kind of dramatic strings and uh, lots of piano chords. And I'd not played any of this because I did it on my phone. And so I used the automated, you know, performance feature on there. And I was just doing this stuff, and I thought, yeah, that's a nice chord progression. And then came up with some chords uh, on the piano, and then came up with it like a lead guitar thing that I played on that, you know, the lead guitar thing on the screen. And I was kind of happy with it. And I thought, you know, I'll I'll stick it into Logic. And of course, when you bring it over, it brings over automatically assigns all the instruments, the correct instruments, because they're all the same. But it also brings over all the MIDI data every single piece of MIDI data and then you can just go in and you can just mess around and tweak and and it's perfect it's absolutely perfect I, I just I'm big big fan big fan of that yep. and it's it's updated uh 2.3.9 is out now uh, available on iOS oh yeah that's the one thing it has to be to get this update you must be running iOS 14 or later which obviously is on 14.1 now I think so right. if you haven't moved to iOS 14 for whatever reason, you can't avail yourself of these features, but uh, it, it's there now. And that, I believe, wraps up all of our news topics, um, which is really nice because it leaves us about 10 minutes or so to kind of wrap things up. So, um, Michael, you were saying you are working on a new album that's going to be coming out soon. Um, oh, well, probably first quarter of next year. Okay. So um, anything else that you've got? In your schedule, uh, with your, your very detailed military-like well, schedule. Uh, what, well, one of the things I, I I will, this is the first place in the world that has this news. So Ooh. everyone just hang on. Everyone hang on, and here we go. <laughs> um, so I run a. I'm the general manager and the head of ANR for an independent record company called Mindstream. M Y N D Stream, mm -hmm. and we do you know ambient, mindful music. That kind of thing. So one of the things that I wanted to do was rip a page from the old Wyndham Hill days. You guys remember Wyndham Hill Records from the yeah. 1980s? Yeah, yeah. And, and they used to do a guitar collection and a piano collection. So uh, early next year, we are going to create a piano collection, wow. a guitar collection, and an electronic music collection, which we are very, very, very far along with, which was going to have some unbelievable people. I cannot say who, but just brace yourself for that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of the music is just is just wonderful. Um, so that's also going to happen early next year, and I, I, I will make sure that everyone knows about it, but it's going to be fabulous. And, and of course, it, it, it bears saying here to, to everyone that's in the chat room, um, and anyone else that's watching that isn't already a member of the ProSynth Network Facebook group, that Michael is an incredibly active uh, and productive member on there, and we thank you for that because your input is is fantastic. Please keep uh, keep doing it. Um, so if you want more information, then I'm sure that you will find that over there when that happens. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks for you know for being an active part of the community because sure. it's it, it's um, it gives like myself uh, and others who are you know maybe aspiring or maybe just you know skirting around the periphery to hear your kind of experiences your knowledge to to willingly share that with the likes of us is is an incredible honor and i, yeah, I just want to say thank you for that well I, I i appreciate that and i think the difference between you and me is nothing so i don't operate in a world of like you know, famous people or well-known people are higher than others. Like there's a lot that everyone can learn from everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to be 55 next month. And, you know, I think one of the things that has kept me successful and moving along is that I'm keeping my ears open. Yeah. And so, um, and I, so I love conversations where people are talking about, 
you know, challenging themselves and creating new things and um, and, and empowering people. So, like, I, I I'm all about that, and I love the community. I think the, I think the community is terrific, and I think there's a lot of things that are terrific. We do get bogged down in like some you know ridiculous conversations occasionally, but I think it I think that's the exception, not the rule. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, now I have forgotten something, and somebody in the chat room has reminded me. Uh, so let me just bring this up because we we launched a new thing a few weeks ago and I've just completely forgotten uh, about doing it uh, this week so let me just bring this up on screen hey, guys seem to have frozen for me are you still there oh no no maybe that's it was a temporary thing it's all right oh, I had a heart attack for a minute as my screen kind of went all frozen um so we, we've been doing these polls um online <laughs> in, right. in the group and um, we had a, a good one the other day, uh, sorry, the other week, um, debating, uh, what was it again, Ben? I can't, I can't, I'm struggling to remember. Well, the first one. Yeah. Um, oh, the first one. <laughs> so long uh, ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody help me in the chat room. What was oh, the first I can't, well, can't, I, 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 my mind's it, gone it blank. About, it, it sounds like really obvious, but wasn't it synthesis the... Uh, oh yeah different types of synthesis and you know the future yeah, of synthesis yeah. That was, yeah that's it so we thought this week um chris came up with this one and, and he um he pitched this in here because we we've got michael coming in um it was about the profit well it's kind of related to the profit five um and i'm just trying to scroll through i, can't, I am so i i apologize massively um it was it wasn't it along the lines of now that he, he's done the profit five? Which yeah. Is what's he what's said next? He would never do. What would you like to see next from uh, Dave Smith? Yeah. Um, so the reason I need to get the details, need the I, I need the, the options. So don't worry, it's yeah. it's coming, it's going slowly. Come on, here we go. <laughs> you see, my my browser. If I don't prepare things in my browser ahead of time because I'm doing all of this in one box, it's. It gets a little bit slow. Right, here we go. So it says, um, let me just switch to the screen topics. Um, we get there in the end. This week's poll for our show. Um, Dave Smith announced that they are working on two new products in addition to the Profit 5 and Profit 10 desktop modules that are scheduled to come out. What would you like them to make? What do you think they will be? And we had a bunch of options that uh, Chris threw in and um, you know I threw a couple in. And... Bizarrely, one of the suggestions I uh, threw in there has kind of come out on top, and that was something completely new. So nothing yeah. that was related to uh, a legacy instrument from the uh, the sequential days. So that came in with uh, 20 votes, something completely new. Um, second place, we had an, uh, another Oberheim collaboration, so maybe something like a, an OBXA Rev2. Uh, following up that, a polyphonic version of the Pro 3, then um, Oberheim's Son of Four Voice, uh, a Prophet VS with lots of knobs, a new version of the Prophet T8 um, coming slowly down Ooh, into single digits. That would be nice. Yeah, a Tempest <laughs> drum machine successor, um, a proper keyboard sampler, which I think would be interesting, um, Poly Evolver Rev 2, Pro 1 reissue. Uh, a rack mounted Pro 3, a rack mount sampler, and finally Mofo X8. Um, so, you know, overwhelmingly, people would like to see something either completely new or maybe another Oberheim collaboration because um, I think those two votes combined are bigger than the next sort of five or six items on there. So, I personally said, you know, something completely new or maybe a Profit VS. Uh, which was Andrew's suggestion, or a, a new version of the Profit 8, because, you know, that's that was a quite a, an impressive machine. Um, so yeah. there you go. That was the um, the, the results of that poll uh, based on our users. But, of course, we'd like to ask our guest, Michael, what do you think? What would you like to see Dave Smith come up with now that we've got the 5 and the 10 and the desktop modules out of the way? What do you think? I mean, unless you've got any insider knowledge. No, I mean, honestly, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I mean, let's go back and talk about the Hydrosynth for a second. I think the reason why it's so popular this year is because they did something new. So it's not copying something. They're not, you know using the ribbon controller and the poly aftertouch, okay, they grabbed it from CS80 from 40 years ago, but um, 
yeah, I would love to see people use all of this technology and all of these, you know, facilities they have to go create something new. I mean, I would tell Behringer, you know, stop copying stuff and yeah. start just on new stuff. Um, you know, the same thing, I think, to Dave, because I think on the one hand, I do understand where Dave is coming from on doing the Profit 5, but now that he's done it, um, you know, get out a blank sheet of paper and say, okay, you know, like, like if you were going to take things in and, and take things in a completely new direction, where would you go? Yeah. I love the idea of having a new keyboard sampler. Like this idea that we like, like, like totally reimagine like what a keyboard sampler would be with all of the new technology and all the new capacity that the new chips have. So it's not like some, you know, clunky, you know, thing from, you know, the eighties, like you've got like state of the art chips in there. Can you imagine what they could do? Yeah. That could be awesome. That could be fantastic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I think it, it didn't. It, is it not how the Profit X kind of w- w- was pushed? That that's like a a sampling kind of uh, keyboard, uh, and you use your own waveforms, or or is it the three D O waveforms that come with it? Mm. Yeah, I no? think the Profit X kind of came. There was a big Ferrari about it, and then it just kind of. I know it's got some some really dedicated users, and I know that a lot of people saw it as a as a great way of taking your samples out live and having it all in one one place. Um, but it wasn't cheap, and I, I, it's it's kind of just like you know the the big hubbub um, just kind of just trickled away. I, I don't know whether it's just I don't move in those circles or what. Native VS says in the chat room that the Prophet X is like a hardware version of Omnisphere. Yeah, yeah, there's that. There is that. Um, I, I mean, I, th- I like you know Andrew's suggestion of a Prophet VS with with lots of knobs on. I mean, the, the whole um, you know vector synthesis thing again, it's a bit like modeling. It's you know people have dabbled with it and then kind of just kind of left let it go. I mean, Simon, I was very lucky. He's you know he gave me that SY twenty two which was, you know, this interesting piece of history where, you know, it's where Dave Smith and his gang were acquired by Yamaha and, and you know, they kind of took the VS concept, married it up with FM for a little bit, and then, you know, they moved on and then did the wave station for Korg, which, of course, was this all-conquering uh, machine for a few years. Um, I'd like to see something, you know, vectory, because I thought, you know, that, that can do some cool stuff. Yeah, the, VS, the, the VS was a great set. Yeah, um, and and some makes it makes some really really cool sound. So yeah, I think that'd be great. Yeah, mm. yeah. but it, again, it's, n- it's nice if they revisit something that never quite realised its potential, and and we we see the next stage of that yeah. technology, isn't it? Yeah, because a lot of, a lot of these ideas are often ahead of their time, and maybe the technology isn't yeah. quite you know where it needs to be. You know, it's yeah, like the Fairlight, for example. You know, way ahead of its time. But you know, so many shortcuts and workarounds to get it to do what it needed to do. <laughs> a few years later, of course, everything come, you know becomes integrated yeah. and, and much easier to do, and you have so much more capability. But yeah, there you go. I almost forgot, but we we got it in in the end. Um, so we'll have another poll for you guys um, at some point in in the week, early early in this week. I think we've got an idea. I think um, Chris was talking about something. So we'll um, we'll put our heads together and we'll come up. And of course, if you have any suggestions for a poll then let us know and um we'll we'll throw it up there and uh, we'll get uh, people's opinions and then we'll discuss them uh, uh on the show when when we next do it so we have just gone past the 10 o'clock uh mark here in the uk obviously it's uh what it's just gone five over there in in new york yep the sun yep. the sun is gone so yeah. we've been talking for hours and hours. I know. If it, <laughs> I, I, I hate this time of year. I so hate uh, this time of year. It's when, so weird right now. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I mean, I, I sit here, this is my desk where I work, and, and now I have to, you know, like, you know, turn lights on two hours before I finish work. It's just horrible. You know, it's just, can't stand it. And it's only going to get worse. Never mind. Uh, Soon uh, be Christmas. Uh, Soon be Christmas. Um, there you go. Michael, thank you so so much for for joining us. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I've learnt a whole bunch of stuff. I know people in the chat room have been saying as much as well. Um, thank you again for for coming on. Thank you for your continued contribution, and um, yeah, all the best for 
everything you've got on your 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 rigid schedule which i'm going to t- try yeah. and take some inspiration from you and um and do something similar myself and guys it, it's been so much fun to be here and talk with you guys and you know let me let me know how i can help with you know whatever you know you guys need on on facebook or here but um you know i'm all about creating a community and and keeping it going so i'm I, I, this is this has been great thank you no it's and and we'll get you on again soon um and yeah. thank you ever so much we really really have enjoyed it um ben have you got anything lined up for the coming week? Because you, you know, obviously, you and I are back to work now. Yeah, well, after after talking with Michael tonight, I'm feeling very inspired. I want to I, I want to set some kind of restricting scenarios up. See what I can <laughs> what I can produce. It. It's good that anyway. It, you get it, that. With those, it, it has, you you really have inspired me. I'm not just saying it because you <laughs> you hear like. I, 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 I'll probably do a couple of hours when when we finish this. <laughs> there you go. That sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> so um thanks ever so much for joining us everyone um to everyone in the chat room thank you um you've played a massive part as ever um in the show and um we welcome your your custom and your uh, patronage of course please remember if you haven't already click the like button on the video and all the videos if you have a spare five or ten minutes just go onto our channel and just like every video if you liked it of course i don't want to pressure you into doing this but <laughs> the thing is in in this day and age likes actually count for something and the more likes and the more subscribers we get then it opens up opportunities that will allow us to expand and do things differently for example we are pretty close to moving to a new streaming platform that will improve the quality and the reliability of everything but it costs money and we do this voluntarily so you know we're going to dip into our own pockets but we'd like to give you an opportunity if you want to 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 help you know help us on our way we can only do that if we have certain amounts of likes and subscribers and that kind of thing so you know spread the word and make sure you hit that you know the like buttons subscribe to the channel um for your own convenience um click the bell so you get notifications of when these shows happen and um yeah thank you again for your ongoing support it is incredibly um welcome and we are honored by your presence thank you to michael um brilliant to have you on we'll speak again soon and we'll have you on again soon because i've really enjoyed this and cheers ben thank you very much for your uh, contribution tonight as always and next week um have we got a guest lined up for next week i Chris is Chris is kind of like our booking agent mostly. And yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. entirely sure if we've got anyone, but if we have, we'll let you know about it in the on the page. And we'll be back same time, same place. And of course, now all the clocks have moved, uh, and we're all back in synchronisation. It's uh, 8 p.m. UK, 3 p.m. on the East Coast, uh, 12 p.m. Uh, uh, midday on the West Coast. And I, I I have a platform here, so I'm going to use it very very briefly for something that's not but to everyone in america um we are thinking of you we know that you're going through some really you know tough times with the whole pandemic uh, you know we're going through tough here as well but you know god you guys have really you know you're dealing with a lot and you have a chance to maybe change that in a few days time i don't care which way you vote well personally i do but that's not the point my point is just get out there and participate in it and and, and go out if you haven't already go and vote have your say because it's the only way that these democracies work the only way that we can make things better so please i I just wanted i know we don't like to do politics but it's an important decision that you need to make and we're watching i will will say one thing just on that particular point that will give you a little bit of hope is that that more people have voted early than everyone who voted in 2016. it's like over 80 million so far isn't it i think yeah yeah so it's gonna actually be it's actually gonna be one of the biggest turnouts in history so and that's here we go and then you know who'd have thought that in in a in a world where we're living in a pandemic um good luck to to who are friends across the pond um and we're thinking of you we're looking we're watching do the right thing um thanks ever so much take care everyone and we will see you all again same time same place next week take care bye-bye thanks guys